Well, thank you, Paul, very much indeed. And our subject over these uh, three weeks of July has been that of leadership. Actually, uh, Paul is slightly ahead of me in the reading. We're going to be looking at the verses just before the passage he read. Um, uh, I took rather longer than I thought going, uh, going through this part of, uh, of John 10. But our subject has been, has been leadership, and we've been looking at the true leadership of God's flock. And I have to say, it's been a great joy to me because uh, the Lord Jesus provides leadership that is unequaled, that is effective, and indeed that is utterly inspirational. I guess it's a fact of life that any organization is profoundly influenced by its leader. Uh, Those who influence an organization always impact the organization for better or worse. And as I've been uh, exploring the leadership of the Lord Jesus... There is nothing more glorious and nothing that can rival it. We have in the Lord Jesus an unparalleled leader. And it is, of course, a subject that we've seen is highly topical. Um, Leadership and corporate culture are kind of key buzzwords, aren't they, here in the city at the moment? And, of course, uh, with yesterday's news uh, of the birth, uh, future leadership is something that's on the mind of all sorts of people. And we've seen in Jesus uh, the authenticity of his leadership. He is the authentic leader from God. And we've seen the achievement of his leadership. So his leadership is authentic. He knows his sheep by name. He cares for his sheep. He owns his sheep. The Lord Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. And Jesus is therefore unlike any other leader. He has only the best interests of every one of his flock in mind. He gave himself selflessly, sacrificially, willingly. He's not like the thief and the robber, the hired hand and the stranger. He enters the gate of the sheep pen through his death on behalf of his sheep. And therefore he is qualified as the good shepherd because he enters through the the gate of his death and his resurrection. He has conquered death. He is the true leader of God's sheep. This qualifies him. Not only is Jesus, however, the authentic leader of the sheep, we've also looked at the achievement of his leadership. And we saw last week that his death is vicarious, that is, he died on behalf of his sheep, that his death was voluntary, he laid down his life of his own accord, and that his death was victorious. He laid down his life only to take it up again, and therefore not only does Jesus' death and resurrection qualify him as leader of the flock, it also qualifies his sheep to go in and out of the pen, if you like. He gives his sheep eternal life through his victorious death, as he carries God's judgment at sin. And this makes the leadership of the Lord Jesus unlike any other leadership you will find anywhere in the world. We're used to saying of, uh, of any leader, oh, they have an Achilles heel. There is no Achilles heel when it comes to the leadership of Jesus. I forget uh, reading um, uh, Beaver's great book on D-Day. Uh, you know, the great military historian. And he had this tiny little throwaway line about um, the American general Patton. Patton was put in charge of a, a, a kind of phony um, uh, division to make the, uh, the enemy think they were going to mount an attack in a different place. And so he was kept waiting before he took command of the division he was actually going to command uh, following the D-Day la- landings. And he wrote to his wife. And his letter was full of frustration And he said, I'm frightened I shall miss out on all the glory. I remember thinking, you know, what a uh, a sour taste that left left in the mouth of of a great leader who was actually looking to go to war for the glory. Every human leader you come across, you'll find there's an Achilles heel, whether it's a Mandela, wonderful leader as he is, or a Churchill, or a great general or a politician, but with the Lord Jesus, he knows his sheep, he loves his sheep, he cares for his sheep, he dies for his sheep, he is the authentic leader of God's true flock. And the city would do well to look at the leadership of Jesus Christ as the city begins to consider 
corporate culture and leadership, there is much to learn. But I want us to look now at how he leads his flock. And this is the last in our series of three on the leadership that Jesus provides. And I want us to see two two very simple and straightforward points. The good shepherd leads his flock by speaking. The true flock, the true sheep, listen. The good shepherd leads his flock by speaking. You simply cannot miss it. Verse 3, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse 4, the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Verse 5, a stranger they will not follow, they flee, they don't know the voice of strangers. Verse 8, the sheep did not listen to them. Verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, they will listen to my voice. And then verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. So then how does the good shepherd lead his flock? The good shepherd leads his flock by speaking. And in this chapter, with its great emphasis on false shepherds, on thieves, on robbers, this is absolutely vital for it defines for us authentic Christian ministry. So every Christian minister would agree that true Christian ministry is pastoral ministry, The word pastor comes from the Latin word pastor, pastor, pastorum, meaning a shepherd, and from the verb pascere. And so Jesus could equally have said, I am the good pastor. There is only one true pastor of the sheep. His is the only qualification that is recognized. Only he has laid down his life for the sheep. He alone has risen from the dead, and he pastors his one flock by speaking, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow. So there is one pastor, one flock. But the one true pastor entrusts this ministry in this gospel to under pastors, to under shepherds, and those of you who know the gospel, by the time you get to chapter 21, he delegates responsibility for pastoring his sheep to the Apostle Peter, whom he has trained to be able to remember and teach his word. And so his final words in the gospel to Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my flock. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. And if the one true pastor pastors his flock by speaking, then the job of the under-shepherd is to pastor the flock by feeding the flock with the word of the one true shepherd. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life. And so we can say in this chapter full of its talk of Thieves and robbers and strangers and false shepherds and those who do not own the sheep, making pretense at being a true leader of the sheep, insofar as an under-shepherd seeks to pastor the flock by taking the flock to a different word, other than the word of the good pastor, the good shepherd, so far is the under-shepherd seeking to divide the flock and set up rival rule to the rule of the good shepherd. Because the good shepherd, the one good shepherd, the only one qualified, leads his flock by his word as he calls out his sheep and leads them to eternal life. And that, of course, sets for us the model for all authentic Christian ministry, which we find everywhere in the New Testament and everywhere in the Bible. How does Paul commission the Ephesian elders when he says farewell to them on the beach at Miletus? I did not shrink from declaring to you and teaching you in public and from house to house. I declared to you the whole counsel of God. I know that after I've gone, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, speaking twisted things. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock over which God has made you overseers. So the ministry of true pastors, of 
real Christian leaders operating as under-shepherds is not to set themselves up, in, themselves up in leadership. It is to take the flock to the word of the one true shepherd. What then is authentic New Testament Christian ministry that seeks to unite and establish the one true flock of God under the one true shepherd? It is a ministry of the word of God. And this means that genuine pastoral ministry is word ministry. It's a ministry of truth, of speaking. A person cannot be a true pastor seeking the health and unity of the flock if the person is not a faithful teacher of the words of Jesus because the way Jesus leads his sheep and his flock is by speaking his word of truth. You know how somebody says, says, uh, says to you, oh, our vicar, he's a great pastor. He's not a very good teacher. Nonsense. If he's not a faithful teacher, he's a rotten pastor. You know how somebody else says, oh, X or Y, they're really hot on the truth. I'm much more concerned for unity. Nonsense. If you're not concerned for the truth of Jesus, you are dividing the flock. If you teach something other than the word of Jesus, you are a full shepherd. You're setting up a form of anarchic rule. You're separating the flock. You're seeking to have more than one true shepherd. People ask me what I think of the new Archbishop, Archbishop Justin Welby. They're just about stopped asking me now. The question about how good or how bad or whether he's any good, the new Archbishop, the question is, does he teach the word of Jesus? I personally found it rather disappointing. The first thing he had to say was, we must listen to the world and see what they have to say on this particular issue. But at the end of the day, the assessment of whether he is a good pastor or not, and I really hope he is, will be whether he has taught the word of Jesus faithfully. And if he hasn't done that, then he will be a divisive shepherd, a false shepherd, a robber, a thief. Now, I think we get terribly shy about this, rather nervous and sort of slightly twitchy about uh, calling out false shepherds and this sort of thing. And I really hope the new archbishop doesn't turn out like that. The signs are that from all of his background, he's going to teach the truth. But I hope he gets on and does it. We get slightly twitchy about it. I don't see why we do. You're used to solvency too. And you're used to Baal, Basel or Baal three, And you're used to uh, the FCA and all the rest of it. And Jesus warned us in the Sermon on the Mount, beware false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothes, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And just because somebody's dressed up in all the finery doesn't mean that they might not underneath it all be a wolf. And here in this passage, we have thieves, we have robbers, we have strangers, we have thieves and robbers, we have wolves, we have hired hands. And the thief and the robber, the hired hand and the stranger is someone who will not faithfully teach the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here are a couple of false models of ministry then, the sacramentalist. Some of you will have sat under sacramentalist ministry where you are told that the good shepherd feeds his flock through the wafer and the chalice. And the great aim is to feed you the bread and the wine because the minister thinks that's how the good shepherd feeds his sheep. And so the emphasis will be on the priest and the celebrant. They will be to the fore. But the good shepherd feeds his sheep through speaking his word. The experientialist will tell you that the good shepherd feeds his flock through giving the flock a sense of the presence of God. And so the emphasis will either be on the worship band and the liturgist or the kind of mystic feeling, the smoke and mirrors and all the rest of it. But the good shepherd doesn't feed his sheep by giving them a sort of spooky sense that he might be out there somewhere. The good shepherd feeds his sheep by speaking. And so authentic Christian ministry will involve the spoken word of Jesus. And you must learn to measure authentic ministry for yourself because you should not recognize the voice of a stranger by asking yourself whether this minister is actually teaching the word of Jesus. 
And then you'll have the celebrity showman who will tell you that the flock of God are led by the gifts and abilities of the church leader, where the personality and public profile of the church leader will be to the fore. But whether it's the sacramentalist, the experientialist, the showman, or the conman, we know that the good shepherd leads his flock by speaking. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hands. The real job of the genuine pastoral minister is to feed the sheep of Jesus Christ. Notice they are his sheep. I find it myself very uneasy when I hear a minister talking about, as some people do in such an ugly way, my church my wardens, my church council, and even I heard somewhere recently, my people. Did you die for them? Have you risen from the dead for them? Are they yours? This is very helpful to me, because my job is to lay before you the words of Jesus, which I'm seeking to do now. And at the end of the day, that's what I will be judged on as success or failure. Not whether I made you laugh or cry, not whether you felt a sense of something spooky that there might be somewhere around the pillar where God is lurking, but that I fed you the word of God faithfully, not shifting from it. So then, there will be one flock and one shepherd. And of course, that stands to reason, doesn't it? If you divert from the truth, you are being divisive. So when somebody says to you, oh, you're so divisive, insisting on this view of marriage or that view of human sexuality. No, no. To suggest that there's some other view of marriage than the teaching of the Lord Jesus is utterly divisive. It's seeking to set up a separate flock under a separate leadership. It's a very brave thing to do. I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to him. I don't want you to look at me I want you to look at him. I don't want you to follow me. I want you to follow him. He is the good shepherd. He laid down his life for the sheep. I haven't. He came down from heaven for you. He loves you. He cares for you. He knows you intimately. He owns you. If you trust him, he is the good shepherd. Well, there is uh, the way in which the Good Shepherd leads his sheep. Let's move quickly now on to how his sheep follow him. The Good Shepherd leads his flock by speaking. The genuine flock of God listen to and follow the Good Shepherd. It's really very simple, isn't it? And you can see it there again in verse 3. The sheep hear his voice. Verse 4. The sheep follow him for they know his voice. Verse 5. They don't know the voice of a stranger. They do not listen to the thief and the robber. Verse 27, over the page now, top of page 32. Look at it to make sure I am teaching you what he says. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. Now you can't miss it. The genuine sheep of God's true flock will listen to the voice of Jesus, the good shepherd. Only he's qualified to lead you. Only he can qualify you to belong. He leads by speaking. If you are a true sheep of the flock of God, you will listen. Now I want to drill down into verse 27 to 29 and notice the security and the responsibility. The security there is in 28. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now I say this becomes more and more precious the longer you go on as a Christian. Do you notice here that the security depends not on you but on him? I give them eternal life, they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father is greater than all. I and the father are one. Where is the security there? Him. 
Uh, you know how it is with your little ones, you know, the th four and five-year-olds, where you have a, uh, probably not a sweet because it melts, but a pound coin or something like that, or a 10p piece, and you hold it in your hand like that, and they're simply unable to prize it out because you are far, far stronger than them. I've long since been able to do that with any of my children. I get beaten up if I do something like that now. The only means I have of controlling my children now is financial. But you know how it is. You hold on tight. No one can take them out of your head. They can't because you're stronger. Verse 28. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. So here is God's qualified shepherd of his sheep. Once he's got hold of you as one of his own who listens to his voice, he will never let you go. Isn't that gloriously encouraging? A, a young Christian said to me last week, uh, last Thursday, oh, I feel such a feeble sheep. <laughs> and that's just the point, isn't it? F sheep are feeble. But it doesn't depend on the strength of the sheep, it depends on the power of the shepherd. That's the whole point about shepherds and sheep. He has you in his hand. He will not let you go. Last November, I went up onto Sydney Harbour Bridge with David Cook, who's an old friend of ours here. It was utterly terrifying. I am terrified of heights. Hate heights, never liked heights. Used to have to do heights in the army. I used to have to do it with my eyes shut and hope for the best. And you go up onto Sydney Harbour, and so I got an email from David Cook, who's Australian, uh, on yesterday. And he's gone very, very, very quiet, but eventually he brought himself to send an email. It was simply entitled, Woe. And then he listed the woes and what he thinks should happen to all the Australian cricket team one by one. And he's dreading coming back here in January. And then he ended, Woe. But up there on Sydney Harbour Bridge, with the great sort of all the way down there, of course, you're strapped on by a thick cable. You look at the cave and you think, there I am. I can't be shaken. And the bridge can't be shaken. It's a massive great thing. It doesn't depend on the strength of the sheep. It depends on the strength of the shepherd. He has hold of you. He will not let you fall. No one can snatch you out of his hand. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from him who loved us in Christ Jesus. But I want to finish on our responsibility because it's running all the way through the chapter. On the one hand, he's got you, he will not let you go. On the other hand, you are responsible. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow. Do you see your responsibility there in the verse? What is it? To listen and to follow. And may I say again, what a great relief this has been to me this week. Because I do feel something of a responsibility for the Tuesday lunchtime ministry, but actually it's your responsibility to listen to his voice. My responsibility is to teach the word faithfully. The rest, I'm afraid, is up to you. You can't pass the buck to me, some priestly figure at home, or to somebody here, there, or other. There's no passing the buck here, is there? My sheep hear my voice, and they follow. So my responsibility does not extend to entertaining you and giving such a funny talk that you all come again next week, making you laugh or cry. I couldn't do that. Your responsibility is to feed on the word of the one true shepherd, I wonder if you've ever thought of it like that. It's not even my responsibility, I don't think, to chase after you with emails and all the rest of it, though we do that because we want you to come and hear. It's actually the sheep's responsibility to listen. And the applications of this, I think, are legion. For those of us who call ourselves Christian in churches led by men who are seeking faithfully to lay out for us the word of the Lord Jesus. Our job is to feed. We organize our lives quite happily to make sure we get two or three square meals a day. We are to organize our life to make sure we are fed with the word of God. And this may well mean significant changes in schedule. Do you know there was somebody who came here from a completely 
non-Christian background, had nothing to do with Christ. He must have been in his 40s. And he started coming to the 4 o'clock on Sunday service. And he is, and his wife, still at the age of 40, were in the habit every Saturday night of going out clubbing till 4 o'clock in the morning. I certainly wasn't doing that. They had children as well. I don't know how they did it. But that's what they did. And do you know, four or five months in, somebody, somebody asked him, what's really changed? He said, oh, I'll tell you what's changed. We don't go out clubbing on Saturday night anymore. I suppose they went on Friday instead. Why not? Nothing against clubbing in the Bible. Why well, they probably went on Friday. Why not? Because we find if we go out clubbing on Saturday night, we can't concentrate at four o'clock on Sunday afternoon. There is a sheep. There is a sheep, a genuine sheep of God who wants to be fed. It's our responsibility to make sure we organize our lives around being fed so that we hear the word of God. And that wouldn't be a bad thing for us to talk about over lunch or as we make our way back. What are you doing to make sure you are being fed? Please don't say the sandwiches are over there. I'm afraid there's no soup this week because it's the summer. What are you doing to make sure you're being fed? Lovely to have a whole crowd down at the partnership summer school being fed day by day by day. For those of us currently attending a church where there is no attempt to teach the word of God faithfully, it may well mean a much more substantial change. I wonder whether you've ever thought about needing to leave the so-called church which you currently attend because the pastor is not faithfully holding out the word of God. It will be true for some of us. There are thieves and robbers. There are strangers. Uh, somebody was just talking to me about, oh, are you going down to Cornwall in the summer? Yes, I will be going down to Cornwall. I spent a lot of my childhood in Liscard Market, which is where all the cattle used to come in. You know, we'd be buying store cattle off the, off the moors. And the, the guys would come down from the, wall, the moors. You know, it was pretty rugged up on the moors. And they'd bring these cattle down that they'd overwintered up there that looked like absolute rakes. They hadn't eaten, it seemed, for about four months. And we called them improvers because there was only one way they could go when they'd have got onto decent land. There are some Christians like that, aren't there? And I, I, I think of some, some of my own relatives who have dutifully gone to a church where they've never actually been taught the words of Jesus. The pastor will have God to answer to. He wasn't a pastor at all. But they're like those improvers. And if only they'd made the decision to change to rich pasture where they were being properly fed. They would have lived a productive, effective Christian life. They would have grown up. I say here at St. Helens, you know, we don't want a church full of immature Christians. It's a pain in the neck, actually, to have a church full of immature Christians. It's like having a family full of three-year-olds. It's a pain in the neck. No, we want Christians who have been fed from the word of God, who stand mature, who exercise ministry themselves, who start to feed others, who pastor the flock as well. And so if you are going to a church at the moment where there is no attempt to teach the word of God faithfully and clearly, it's probably time to make some big decisions. Ah, oh, well, there are many other applications. Investigating the Christian faith, am I a sheep or not? Will you listen to his word? That's where you go to his word. How are we going to reach the city, the thousands out there, by taking the word of the good shepherd? They're not going to magically kind of come in here in September because, no, no, the sheep hear his voice. And so if our colleagues are going to, going to turn to follow Christ, they need to hear his voice. And God has put you in the office to ensure that they do. Well, there we are. Next week, we move on to what looks like an outstanding series. I'm going to be away, but uh, we've got a great series as a number of you speak and uh, take us to the Bible through the August period. And the question we're looking for is, please take us to the word of Jesus and feed us. Let's pray together. We thank you, our Father, for the wonderful leadership of Jesus, how it stands out in this world as unique. Thank you that he loved us, that he loves us still, that he cares for us, that he died for us. Please help us to make a priority of hearing his voice. In Jesus' name, amen.